Let's pray and then we'll look at Luke chapter 1. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, we thank you that he's with us here this morning by his Spirit. Help us to see him and to understand his Word, we pray. Amen. Well, this has been an interesting summer in the UK. You might have looked at some of the weather images a few weeks ago and seen all across Europe it was roasting away and then up in the, in the, the UK it's been quite average, a bit wet, very British. We live in the UK and so we don't get these uh, big extremes. We don't see great storms or volcanoes or tornadoes and that kind of thing happening. It's all, quite, it's all quite respectable a lot of the time. But every now and again, you might be out walking and it's really windy, or we get a proper storm here and there. And you become aware that actually there is a great power around us, which is sometimes awakened and sometimes reveals itself. Have you ever walked through maybe where there are trees and the wind catches the trees and you felt a little bit uneasy thinking, I I I've had it if a big branch comes down. There is great power that we see around us in the world. And it's there. There's great power in the world. It's there all the time. And so often we're focused on what we can do. When you think of God, what words come into your mind to describe him? If you were to write down five words to describe God, what would they be? Well, before long, we're going to say, well, God is, yeah, God is powerful. And do you know, everyone actually knows that. Every one of us here this morning know that God is full of power. In Romans 1, verse 20, it says, For the invisible things of him, that's God's nature, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that means every one of us here this morning, we know in our heart, God has put it there, that there is a God, and that God is full of power. But by itself, that probably doesn't excite you. A God who is full of power and much more powerful than me, in itself is not good news. And if you are a, a sinner, and that's all of us here this morning, and we have offended him, to know that he is full of power is not good news. And so what I want to do this morning is to look at Luke chapter 1 and see that with God, verse 37, nothing shall be impossible. This verse is telling us something about God. It's revealing his power to us. And what I want to do is to see, take it down from this abstract idea of God is powerful and see well, what does it mean? Is that really good news for us? Can it ever be good news for us as sinners? And we will see that, yes, it is. So I want to first of all just look at this, uh, at God's power, and then see particularly, how did he show it? How did he show it? So the big word that you may have heard used is omnipotent. You've heard that word before. And that just means all-powerful. That God is, he you and I, we're thinking earlier, we have limits, we can lift some things, and then we, we reach our limit quite soon. And when we say that God is omnipotent, we're saying that he has no limits. So you can just go on and on, and it's boundless. You never get to the edge. That's what it means to be infinite. But have a think about this. Can God do literally anything? Can he do literally anything that you can imagine? And the answer is, no, he can't. Let me give you some things that God can't do. Perhaps you can think of some. God can't lie. God can't fail in something he sets out to do. He can't break a promise. He can't let guilty people go free, unpunished. He can't love his people any more than he does. You might have heard silly, uh, this kind of silly question that people ask sometimes. Can God make a rock that is too big for him to lift? How would you answer that? 
Well, the answer is absolutely not. Of course he can't do that. But what do all those questions have in common? That God, he can, he can and I'm going to read, this is the verse from 2 Timothy, it says this in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, God cannot deny himself. So God can do anything. With God, this verse says in our passage, verse 37, with God nothing will be impossible. But all those things that God does, he always acts in accordance with who he is. He always acts as a good God, as a gracious God, as a God who is perfect and holy and kind and just and righteous. He always acts according to the way he is. And so that's why he can't make a rock that's too big for him to lift. He can't make someone great, can't make something greater than himself. He's God. And we, we try and do good. And we, if we're Christians, we want to do good. And you, you've probably felt that inside you. I want to do good things. I want to do good things all the time. And yet I fail. It's so hard. There is such, it seems that our capacity to do God's will seems so limited, seems so small. And yet, we look at God and He is good and He does good and His power is limitless, boundless, infinite and He can only do what is good. Now that is what we mean when we say that God is powerful. But that leaves us with some questions, doesn't it? There are many things that God could do, and yet he doesn't do. There are many things that we would look at and say, well, that's a good thing. Why isn't God doing that? And he doesn't do it. God could take away all the illnesses and sicknesses in this congregation. But he's not doing it. God could get rid of all the bad people in the world straight away. He could stop evil people from planning evil things and then carrying them out. We could have more, couldn't we? And why? And that can be perplexing for us. And as we look at, you look at Leicester, we want people to be saved. We want people to become Christians. And we think, well, it's, it's not a difficult thing for God. If God is the one who has the lightning in his hand and he can at any moment just shoot it down then why doesn't he just save more people? Why is he so slow, it seems, in doing what we think should be done right now and is urgent? If he has all power, why doesn't he use it more than he, it seems to us, does do? In our passage, I hope we can find answers to some of those questions. If he saved 3,000 people in one day at Pentecost... Surely he could save that many or more today in Leicester. Why, why does he work in the way he does? Well, we can't take all, away all the mystery, but I want to look at this passage and see that we really can have confidence, verse 37, that with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing shall be impossible with God. So, let's read again verse 30. To 33 of Luke chapter 1. The angel appears to the Virgin Mary. Fear not, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Where can we expect to see God's power? Where is the place where the all-wise God, who's completely wise, never does anything wrong, never does anything in a slightly less good way when there was a better way, where is the place where he has chosen to display his power? to make it known so that we can confidently see God is working in the world. God is doing something. God has done something. And it's here. It's in 
the face of Jesus Christ. In Christ, that's where God is displaying his power. So we, we, we looked at this hymn earlier on, number 110. And it's a wonderful hymn. Listen to these words where, this is someone called William Gadsby. He says in verse 4 of this hymn, In his highest work, redemption, see his glory in a blaze. And then in verse 3 he says, Would we see his highest glory? Do you want to really see God? Do you really want to see him at work to see what he's really like? Do you want to see the maximum of God's glory possible in this world? You do if you're a Christian. Here it shines in Jesus' face. And he says that even angels can't tell you something, can't mention something that more of God displays. I think he's right. I think he's spot on with his uh, theology in that hymn. He that has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. God has shone the light in our hearts so that we would see, we would have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so in Luke 1, do you want to see power on display? The power of God. This is, this is the place to look. And Luke 1 shows us the limitless power of our Father in heaven on display. So just consider what's happening. Where are we in Luke 1? This is thousands of years on from a promise. Back, back just right when Adam and Eve sinned, right near the beginning of the world, near the beginning of creation. There was a promise made that God would send the seed of the woman to bruise the serpent's head. And that promise, the promise of the Messiah, is still unfulfilled thousands of years later. And the, the promise has crystallized a bit. It's, there's some more details being added. He would come from the tribe of Judah. He would be born of David's line, King David. And yet, the glory of the kingdom of Israel has come and gone. You remember that? There was King David, and then there was King Solomon. And under King Solomon, it, it seemed wonderful. The, 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 the nation of Israel, the kingdom, never looked so good. And then shortly afterwards, what happened? It split into two. They were disobedient. And finally, with the passing of time, they went into exile. Still no Messiah. It wasn't David. It wasn't Solomon. It wasn't any of the kings who came after. No Messiah. And now the people of Israel are in their land, but under the control of a foreign power in the Roman Empire. So we have a utterly unable people, a powerless people, a people who can't make God uh, hurry what he's doing, a people who can't help themselves. And then we can take it further. What do we find in verse 26 and 27? The angel was sent from God to a virgin and the virgin's name was Mary. So we don't just have a whole nation of people who are utterly unable to bring God's purposes to happen. What do we have? We have a woman, a young woman, who in herself, she's no more able than anyone else to bring the Messiah into the world, to make God's power known. And so we're faced with not something which is sort of that happens one time out of a hundred, or even one time out of a thousand, but we're faced with something which is completely impossible. Virgins don't conceive. And we're used to, we're, it's, it's sort of a basic statement of belief, isn't it, for Christians, that the virgin conceived, we were tick, we believe in the virgin birth, but think about it, this is an, an astounding thing to say that we believe. This can't happen. And so Mary's question to the angel, Mary said to the angel, verse 34, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? It's a very, it's quite a reasonable question. For a virgin to conceive requires power. Not natural power, but supernatural power. Not a power that any created thing has, but only that the one who designed and built the universe and the order of how things work, only that one has the power to make that happen. And what happened? Mary conceived in her womb 
brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. But that's not the real mystery on display. I could talk about the virgin birth. So that's not real, the, the end of it. It's not just what happened, but who it was. Who it was who is conceived, think about that, who is conceived in the womb of this young woman. Who is this? Well, verse 32. He should be called the son of the highest. Verse 35. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Who is this Holy One? Well, if you could turn to Isaiah 40. And in this wonderful chapter, uh, verse 9 is good news. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. And it talks about the Lord coming. The Lord God coming with a strong hand, verse 10. And who is he? Well, he is the one, verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. He meets out heaven with the span. He comprehends the dust of the earth in a measure. He weighs the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. This is the one who, verse 16, Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast sufficient for a burnt offering. What's he saying? You imagine a country with great forests and it's got massive trees in them, a whole country worth of forest. If you chopped them all down and made a great heap and then if you took all the animals in the country and sacrificed them and put them on that heap and you, you sent up this great sacrifice, this, this offering, a burnt offering to God, to heaven. He's saying that would be nothing, that would be insufficient a sacrifice for a God this great. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. And we, can, we could go further, couldn't we? We could say all that we are, all that we have, the best things of all of us put together, it's not enough to praise God with. Because God is the one who is exalted above all blessing and praise. In other words, what you and I offer him doesn't cut it. Now, he is loving and he is gracious. He is not expecting us to offer what we cannot give. But the point is that God, in his greatness, he is worthy of the praise of all creation and then, and then above, stretching on and on. This is God. And we read in verse 38, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 38 of Job, that God is the incomparable one who laid the foundations of the earth, as we've thought, the one who has the lightning at his command and can just send it down. So when you see the lightning and hear the thunder, that's not just some accident. That's the voice of God and the power of God on display. And so then you turn to Luke chapter 1 and it says, Blessed are you, verse 28, highly favoured, blessed you are among women, Fear not, Mary, you have found favour with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Who is this? Who is this one who is conceived in the womb? This is our God. This is Jesus. That great creator who we, we, are, we scale the top of the mountain and then we see that it's, it's extending higher and higher. There's another ridge to climb and then we climb that one and we see extending higher and higher the greatness of God that we can never climb and reach and see the fullness of who he is. Our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man, Charles Wesley. But you see, Charles Wesley could have gone further. A span is your, your hand from your thumb to your little finger. This isn't just God contracted to a span. This is a conception in a womb. The one conceived in that womb, the one whose body is forming, the one who's being knit together by the power of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the one who at the same time is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. The one who is before all things and at the end of all things and who sustains all things. The one in whom we live and move and have our being. 
That's who you worship. That's who died for you on the cross. And that's who is in a secret place, hidden from human eyes. His human body being formed by the power of the Spirit. That's what we believe. That's the basis of our faith. That's the power of God on display. What God can do, what you and I could never have. It has not entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And that's not just telling us about heaven, that there is something that God has planned from the foundation of the world that he's going to do. He's going to come in the person of his son. So, the power of God on display. And then I'm going to quote Wesley again. What else happens? Tis mystery all. The immortal dies who can explore his strange design. So this one, Christ Jesus, who is in the womb, he not only comes, but then he lives a real human life. And then being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. And what did he do? He humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. The one who hung on that cross, the one who was conceived in that womb, the one who, as a child, was in the arms of uh, an ordinary Jewish woman. Who was that? Turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Where does God reveal his limitless power? If you want to know what that big, and it's frankly not necessarily a very interesting word, omnipotence, what does it mean? Omnipotence equals Jesus Christ revealed in his person and in the work that he did. That's what we mean by omnipotence in the Bible. God doesn't just display himself by, by showing, well, I've made creation. We can't get our minds around creation. But if you really want to understand what infinite, limitless power looks like, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. And here it is. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. Christ, the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. What does God is powerful mean? What does it mean nothing shall be impossible for God? It means this. It means that God has come. Not just a virgin birth, but the virgin birth of this one. Not just a virgin birth, but a real life and death and resurrection of this one, Jesus, the Son of God. And so I want to come and just apply these things to ourselves. And just before we do that, one more detail to notice from the passage of, of, of Luke 1. How did it happen? How did God do this? The text doesn't reveal to us any more than is necessary for us to know. But what he does say is very useful. Notice verse 35. Mary asks the question, how shall this be? Verse 35, here's the answer. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. How does God do what he does in revealing Jesus Christ? He does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's absolutely key. And that's so useful for us. It's one of the fascinating things about 
the, the earthly life of Jesus is that he had an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. He, when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, it was a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we read in, a bit later in Luke, Luke picks this up in Luke 3 verse 22, the Holy Ghost descended on Jesus. When it says Holy Ghost, more modern, we would say the Holy Spirit. That's who it's talking about. And then in verse 4, sorry, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He has an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. This is how God works in the world to display the glory of God, to display His Son, to exalt His Son. He does it by the Spirit. Okay, one more verse, Acts chapter 2. Um, 10 and verse 38. Again, this is, the, this is Luke writing. And he says, How God anointed Jesus, Acts 10 verse 38, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So from beginning to end, in that moment that secret hidden moment when the incarnation happened, not at Bethlehem, but several months before, when the virgin conceived, it was the power of God displayed, it happened because of the Holy Spirit. And then through the, 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 the life of Jesus in this world, where he lived as a perfect man amongst us, fully God, truly God, truly man, he did it anointed with the Holy Spirit. It was by the mighty work of the Spirit from beginning to end. Now hold that thought as we come to think, what does this mean for us? So, in a really short way we can tie these things together in Luke chapter 1. is simply what the angel says to, to Mary. Verse 13. The angel said unto her, fear not. Now why, why would we fear not? Well, if God has done the big thing, we don't have to be afraid about the lesser thing. This is the way that we find uh, the Apostle Paul arguing in the book of Romans. He says, if God, the greatest one, is for us, then who all these lesser, infinitely small things and people and enemies, who can be against us? And then he says also, he that spared not his own son, he's done the most he can do, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? If he's given, if he in a sense has, if I can put it like this, if he has emptied heaven of its greatest jewel, then he can provide your daily bread. He can help you in every situation you find yourself in, in this tiny planet, in a massive universe. He's, 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 he's quite able to help us. And so what, 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 what has God done in Luke 1? This is the, the virgin conception. This is God come. We can surely then hear what the angel says. Well, fear not. I mean... Can you see the power of God on, on display? If he has done this, can he not keep you, help you, comfort you, restore you, provide for you? Is it not sinful to be full of anxiety and fear and worry and trembling and distraction about your future? If you were in control of the world and if you were the master of history, then tremble and be very afraid. But... You're not. God has already done something. Jesus has already come. Fear not is the first thing. What things do you fear? What are the things that you say are impossible? Do you fear getting old? Dying? Do you fear, if you're in your late teens or early 20s, do you fear adult life? Do you fear you might be called to suffer for Christ or what people might say of you who are not Christians? Do you think that the Christian life just seems so hard and impossible? 
Are you afraid of obeying God in something he calls you to do? Do you think it's impossible for me to defeat this temptation, this area of struggle? That's just never going to change. That's just the way it is. Is that what you say? Certainly, it's impossible for you. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. God has done the greatest thing. These things are small fry. Everything that happens in your life is small fry to God. With God, nothing should be impossible. Why? Because look at what he has done. Look at who he has sent. Look at how that went. Look how victorious and triumphant and successful God was in bringing to pass everything he planned by the power of the Spirit. And it is that same Spirit who worked in Jesus that is in the world today. It is the same Holy Spirit who is with us here this morning. It is the same Holy Spirit who dwells in each of you who are saved. The invincible Holy Spirit. The one who is truly God, just as the Father and the Son are God. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. If God is for us, who can be against us? So what are you called to do? Well, you're called to do this. Fear not, follow Jesus, and do what he's called you to do. Fear not, follow Jesus, and do what he has called you to do. And then just to close... God's power, we've seen, is great, it is unstoppable, and it is fixed in one direction. It is heading towards the glorification of his Son. He is going to exalt Jesus. That's the way history is going. Now, on some of the more modern tube carriages in London, they, they've taken away the barriers between the different carriages, and so it's just one long line, and you can, you can walk, uh, walk a long way if you so choose. It doesn't matter which way you walk along that carriage. You can walk against the flow of the train or with the flow of the train. But you're going that way. You're going the way the train is going. Now, can I say this to you this morning? It doesn't matter whether you live for Jesus Christ or you decide, I don't want him in my life. I don't want to submit to him. I don't want to live for Jesus. The train is heading in one way and you and the rest of humanity are on that train. You can walk against the flow of that train, but you are actually hurtling towards your destiny. And that destiny is where we're all headed. To the end of all things, when Jesus comes back, a day of judgment, when Jesus is revealed, those who see him and love him will be transformed and will be made into his likeness. When there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. That's where it's going. That's where it's going for me. That's where it's going for you. Can I encourage you? Can I beg you if you are not submitting to him? If you're still resisting him? Consider what train you are on. Consider which way it is going. And then look into the fullness of what God has done and see that his power is not something that which you have to just be in terror of. You can trust him. He has sent the Lord Jesus into the world. He was born of a virgin and he died for our sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that with you nothing shall be impossible. We thank you that you have done the great thing. We pray that you would help us to trust you for everything else. And we ask that in his name. Amen. Well, let's sing. We've been thinking about judgment. Let's think four, six, seven. And will the judge descend?
Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.